hello, I'm John Holmes, and today we'll be talking about the SCX-102 that has just been released. I have already done one review on it, and I went and picked up a kit for myself and built it all myself and figured that, hey, if, if I am excited enough about this rig to build it myself, it's been since 2008 since I've built a kit for myself and did not hire out somebody else to do it, and I think it's worth sharing. So we're going to go through, list all the positive and negatives that I see on the rig, and uh, just list the features out. So to start off, um, they really changed up their plastics, I noticed on the rig. We have a mix of more reinforced, fiber reinforced plastics on the inside, and then more resilient, flexible plastics on the outside of the rig, the, the places where it may have impacts or hits on the shock hoops as well. They're uh, much nicer and stiffer than on previous versions. And so they really did a good job of overall improving the concept of the rig and how they want it to perform in the long term. Now, the axles probably are the most standout feature. You can see that they had little red highlights on the differential cover and on the link mounts, just like full-size rigs do these days. So it's a pretty good look to them. But they also have a much smaller pumpkin. And you can see up here on the, the close-up, it's a very small ring and pinion gear here, and they really shrunk down the size of those tubes. And that gives you mostly a scale benefit, but it also gives you more ground clearance as well. Uh, so it will be a performance boost in many ways, but also a looks boost. And I'm really into that. So, well, the axles, they've done a great job, even just on the outside. Now, going to the performance of the axles, they have a lot of steering stock from the factory. They come with universal joints, uh, not a dog bone and cup setup, but uh, universals. And so that was a really good call on this kit. High quality components from Axial on this. And we'll be very pleased to see just how much steering that we can get, get out of these universals. Even with a little bit of modification, you can see up here on the close up camera that it really turns far out of the box. The next thing that they did on the axles was to increase the gear ratio. They went from about a 2.8 to 1 ratio up to a 3.75 to 1 ratio. And if you don't understand what that means, it is basically that the drive shaft going to the axle has to turn more times for your tire to turn one time. The big deal about this is that with more axle reduction, you get less torque twist on the axle from the reaction of your transmission mounted in the chassis going to that uh, transfer of power to your axle. So that's going to be a performance gain, a reduction of torque twist, and really just a more active suspension under load than you would be able to get with a lower reduction axle, such as their previous design on the SCX-10. But I think they really did a good job on this. The downside is that the ring and pinion gear is smaller. However, the tooth mesh and tooth engagement, as shown in my previous video, is about the same amount. We may not actually see a problem with strength on these. I certainly hope not. And with the amount of engineering that they've been doing, I really think that they covered all their bases on it. Now, they went with an oversized inner pinion bearing on this version. And we'll show a little close-up of the actual axle here. On the interior bearing here, they went to a 5 by, let's see, it's a uh, 5 by 11 by 4 on the previous design. Also the same as what's the exterior bearing and the new bearing is 5 by 14 by 5 millimeters on the inside. This is what a lot of aftermarket companies have been doing with their uh, aftermarket axle housings, and it's really good to see Axial do that on their stock release as well. So th they're paying attention to the market, and this release has really just met every expectation in every way that I can think of. Now, there's a lot of little details. Maybe I'll miss something, but they've really done a good job overall. Now, the axle tubes themselves, are also clamping design. Uh, again, taking what the aftermarket has uh, shown to be a better design, you can see the clamping onto the tube right here. This is the, uh, the, the C-hub or the chub, as people call them. And then on the rear axle tube, you can also see that they have a clamping design on there. And that just keeps them from getting loose and from coming off. There's also a spline that fits in between the two, and so it prevents it from twisting as well, which is very nice for the front axles. Really good design all the way around. Now, they also went with a sealed uh, rubber shielded ball bearing on the outside of the, uh, the vehicle. Basically, any point where a bearing is going to be exposed to the outside, they went with a rubber shield, which uh, forward thinking on their behalf, 
um, on the inside that uh, supports the ring and pinion, or specifically the ring gear itself, they went with an unshielded bearing, and this will allow that the, the grease from the gears to get into the bearings and keep them lubricated as well. In the previous video, I had described the smaller bearing surface. These new lockers have a 7mm bearing surface, whereas the previous lockers had a 10mm bearing surface, and I conjectured that it would probably lead to some bearing problems. It's a smaller bearing. But after reviewing it, it actually is a larger ball bearing on the inside with a smaller ID and an almost as big OD. So it went from being a 7 by 14 by, uh, or I'm sorry, it went from being a 10 by 15 by 4 millimeter bearing, and the new bearing is now 7 by 14 by 3.5. I confirmed with the axial engineers that these new ball bearings, even though smaller in size, they actually have a higher load rating to them. Uh, so the engineering and Axial, again, doing their job as they should, they really covered all the bases that I can even come up with on this axle. So we'll see if there are any problems on it. Uh, another feature to take notice of here is the high pinion angle here. Uh, so the, the pinion comes in not on center to the axle, but it comes in above center on the axle, and that would be considered a high point gear. It is... Uh, a lot of design work to get into them. It really is a lot of design work. Uh, elevated pinion with a high point gear, I'm sure they probably spent a couple hundred hours engineering that properly. I wouldn't want to do it and I've tried. I really tried to do my own uh, uh, bevel gear set myself and it is really a lot of work. It's very difficult to do. So congrats to Axial on getting it right. It's a, a very smooth rolling axle as well. The uh, transmission on mine still needs to break in just a touch, but the axles themselves have been very impressed with the pinion mesh. I thought that it was going to be a little more bindy, more like a worm gear, because it is kind of one step away from a worm gear in, in design, but it, uh, it, it's very smooth. Once you get everything in there and seated, uh, no problems at all. I don't foresee there being any problems. But we're going to throw some big brushless power at it anyway and try to destroy it in time. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the chassis. After talking about destroying the parts with high power, that's always the best part, but the chassis is essentially the same as the old SCX-10. Matter of fact, you could install one on an SCX-10 if you wanted to. However, they installed a couple more holes on there. They drilled a couple more holes during the design, and it'll give you some wheelbase adjustment, and it also allows some extra you know, uh, features to be bolted into the frame there. So backwards compatible with the SCX-10. I could actually use a regular SCX-10 frame on this one the way that I have it configured right now, but hey, it's a kit. I'm gonna put it together with the parts that comes with it. Not too big of a deal there. Now they did make the shock coops uh, thicker, more reinforced than the previous design. Really wasn't too much problem with the old ones other than get them getting loose over time since it is uh, threading into plastic. But they beefed them up. They also made the threading into plastic engagement much better on these two. So it really covered both the bases that uh, the old shock coops had some issues with. Now the uh, other improvement that they have made in the chassis realm is that their threaded links are now four millimeter threaded studs inside of these larger, beefier links, aluminum links, which is just a little more solid, not going to have as many problems, say you fall off a eight-foot cliff or something like that. With the smaller threaded links, it would pop a rod in right out or break the link in half. With these, it just won't be as likely. It's a much beefier setup. They also went with a forward and standing up battery mount on this version. Now this is a 5,000 milliamp hour four cell pack, so it's 14.4 uh, you know, volts, much more than I would ever want to use in this rig. But it's the standard size of a stick pack that you would find, uh, say from a racing vehicle or something that you would be bashing with a Traxxas. Typical Traxxas vehicle has this standard size of battery pack. And so they wanted to accept a normal size battery pack and still cram everything really forwards into the frame and also get a chassis mounted servo. You can see that we have that chassis mounted servo there has a uh, three link with the, uh, the drag link and the track, track link, I think they're called there. Uh, lack of bump stop, very pleased with, with their lack of bump stop on this. Uh, again, the engineers spent a lot of time getting that right. And uh, you know maybe a little spacer here and there to make it just perfect, but out of the box, it, it's as close to perfect as one could ask for for a kit, in my opinion, certainly. So, uh, you know, forward battery mount, you can have a lot more weight in this vehicle and it's going to keep your weight bias really far forwards. Now this, uh, it, it's certainly further forwards than 50% weight bias on this. 
uh, with a large battery, and that's for uh, performance reasons is going to be amazing being able to do that. Uh, we're going to end up running smaller packs in this rig on the long term. I usually recommend a 33, uh, or I'm sorry, a three cell 2200 pack. A 35C discharge rate is a good discharge rate to go with. We'll cover the electronics a little bit more in a few minutes here. Now, moving on to the transmission, probably the most grumbling that I've heard is for this transmission. And we look at the overhead shot and you can see that it comes from a transfer case that transfers right to the middle of the chassis, great for torque twist and handling. It goes to the little transfer box here and then into a central transmission that will allow a two-speed conversion in the future. It's a dog clutch style. Uh, they have a little shift servo that will be mounted back here. And, uh, as it comes, I am very pleased with the lack of backlash this transmission has. Uh, normally, having that many gears and uh, shafts in a transmission, you're going to have a lot of uh, play with the wheels going back and forth. And uh, we can compare it to other vehicles in a future video series, but very pleased with the, with the minimal amount of backlash. They also used uh, 32 pitch gears for the pinion and the spur gear to prevent strippage, hopefully. I've never had an issue with 48 pitch myself, but some people do, and so they went that extra step and included those as standards. Again, uh, I'm saying it over and over here, but great job by the engineers at Axial Racing really thinking of every small detail that uh, could be come up on this. So the uh, transmission also has all steel gears on the inside. Uh, again, thinking for the high power user or the person that doesn't want to be broken down and buying aftermarket parts, they put steel gears into the transmission stock. The gears that are in the axles are as well a uh, machined axle, or, I'm sorry, a machined set of gears. And so strength wise, they, they really try to cover their bases. The plastic shafts are the Wild Boar 8 style. And they're practically a solid plastic shaft. I have had great results with these. And I actually prefer to keep these plastic shafts instead of switching over to a, a steel drive shaft such as an MIP. Great quality for MIP stuff. However, if you remove the weak link, the weak link in your drivetrain, then you're gonna to have to chase a breakage elsewhere. So I prefer to keep it in a really easy to find spot. I can get to this with a wrench, switch out a drive shaft in usually under a minute. And I don't have to worry about it. They're cheap, they're easy to find and easy to get to. So I like having that plastic uh, drive shaft in the back and the Wild Boar 8s are, are fantastic. Uh, really pleased to see the new design on those. So uh, finishing up with the transmission here, we have the centered outputs. It also has a fairly low center of gravity for the motor um, as compared to having, let's say, a forward mounted motor. If you were going to mount the motor all the way forward, you would have to clear the suspension cycling. Let's do this on the front if we were going to have a front mounted motor. You would have to clear the, the suspension cycling and so you can pretty much visualize that you can't have a motor hanging any further down than the frame itself. And if we do a side shot of the motor, you can see that it actually does sit much below the frame rails. Uh, so although a lot of people don't seem to like how they place the motor in there, it, uh, it actually is going to end up being the best situation all around. At least, uh, at least for a stock setup where, you, where you're trying to make everything happen. Now the stock transmission is one ounce heavier than the old style SCX-10. However, it, uh, you know, placing the motor as centered as it does and getting the weight distribution left to right in the chassis as well as it does, I, uh, I think it's going to be worth it. So I'm going to run it with this transmission for sure and go from there. Uh, the build tips that I would have after putting one together for myself is that uh, the shocks themselves are very smooth, but you do have to get the pistons inside sanded down very smooth on the edges. So be sure that you cut off all the little bits of uh, flashing from your shock pistons and then go the extra step and take some 400 grit sandpaper and sand down the edges. And that will make sure that they don't bind up and that you get a very smooth suspension right out of the box. That's the biggest complaint that I've seen online and I think it can be solved with just a little bit of forethought when it's being built. I've built a few kits in my day uh, so I, I knew to look out for that. Uh, otherwise, pay attention to all the little uh, bits and bobs in there. There are quite a few links that are very similar in, in length, and it's easy to take one and accidentally substitute it for another. Uh, we don't want uh, to, to have that happen. You know, you'll know, have to call Axial and get some new links, or you know, maybe you think that they had messed up on a kit when in fact that all the uh, parts were indeed in, uh, in supply. I did that myself a few times. There was a couple parts that I put in the wrong place, and I was going through, hey, we're, we're missing parts now. Uh, 
I just had to go back and find where I put them. So it, it was, you know, me thinking, boy, Axial messed up on this one, and it, yeah, it was really my fault. It's, uh, so just pay very close attention when you're putting the kit together so that you don't accidentally put parts in the wrong place and then come up short on uh, future parts in the kit. Now, for the final setup, we'll need to install electronics on here. And what I have is essentially a Crawlmaster Pro 540 installed in the rig. And uh, we did a little bit of extra heavy wire fill for the purpose of testing. And we may end up releasing a custom motor that is uh, more specifically tuned to this rig. But a, uh, a speed of, say, a 35 turn Torque Master or a 16 turn Crawl Master is a great start if you want to do pretty much all rock crawling. If you want to go on the trails more often, though, I would suggest somewhere about a 27 turn Torque Master or a 13 turn Crawl Master. Uh, alternatively, for brushless motors, if you want to crawl, then about 2200 kV is going to be the good range to go in. And if you want to do more trail running and going faster jumping stuff, then maybe 2700 kV or 3500 kV, which is my personal favorite for brushless. You can get the, the high KV, run it on 3S LiPo, again a 2200 milliamp hour pack with three cells and 35C discharge rate would be my recommendation. Put the extra voltage onto it, gear it down as much as you can and that 3500 KV choice is going to give you the best drag brake and low speed performance that you can get along with the wheel speed that you need and plenty of torque to go around. Even a Polar Pro stubby is going to be enough power to break most of the drivetrain in this vehicle. And so if you want to go, you know, even larger in, uh, in size of motor, or if you want to go with a higher KV motor, sure you can, but you will have to be careful. Make sure you keep your slipper clutch very important so you don't break drivetrain parts. And also have a good eye on the rig. If it's going to fall down and you're under full throttle, let off your throttle so your wheels aren't churning and hitting that ground full speed when the ground's not going anywhere. That's a sure way to break your, uh, your rear plastic drive shaft that is easily replaceable if, uh, if you don't pay attention to that. So just uh, a little bit of forethought with uh, both the driving and the rig setup will, will help greatly in the future. The next upgrade that I'm probably going to do on this is switching out the tires. We don't have a whole lot of bare rock surfaces. We, we have a lot of uh, you know, wet and sandy and loamy materials around here, a lot of more trail riding than just rock crawling. And so I'm going to go with a tire that I really like, and that's the Ot6 Racing's KLR in a 1.9 size. The uh, compound that I typically choose is going to be their medium hardness. I believe that is the uh, silver and uh, for this lightweight vehicle is going to be pretty good. Now you could go with the blue compound as well and it'll just wear longer for you and uh, you'll be able to have either a heavier weight vehicle or tune your suspension and, and your traction and your wheel speed to work out for that different compound. So that should about cover where we're going to go next with it. Uh, we'll take some trail videos of it and we'll also compare it to a few other rigs uh, most notably the Viterra Ascender, and we'll also be comparing it to the Trail Finder 2 from RC4WD. I think they are excellent comparisons in the market considering the features that this rig has, you know, the possibility of a two-speed, it has the, the very nice small scale looking pumpkins. It's uh, going to be an interesting comparison and we'll see which one falls out as the best choice if there is one, and that's going to be, that's going to be about it. So if y'all have any specific questions that you want to see about this rig, specific comparisons that you would like to see to other rigs, or a specific rig that we may have to compare it to, just give us a shout in our comments section below. Let us know if we are on Facebook with this. Give us some, some comments in Facebook, and we can help you out there too, and make sure that we get the questions answered that you have for us. So this is John Holmes saying goodbye for today, and y'all go play with some toys.